Hello and welcome back to a Hearts of Iron 4 tutorial stream. I'm Hydronum and this is Italy. We're on part 2 where I'm going to go over the basics of what you see in front of you map wise as well as going very quickly into different unit types before getting into the meat and potatoes of the stream itself, which, well of the recording itself which is we're going to start dealing with front lines, enemies, combat and war which is why you're here. Okay, now if we quickly zoom in, we'll have a look over here. There's the border with France. You can see it's France by the blue colour. We've got the German Reich, which is black. United Kingdom here. We've got Italy, which is ours. It is this dark green colour. There's Bulgaria there, but that's not us. We've got Italy. It's got a nice Italy on it, which is good. If we zoom out, we get rid of the... Uh, the air bases and ports. Now, you'll see that there's a lot of stars. These are the capitals of the various different states. The capitals will move in war if you have taken a capital of some country and the, well, it will then move to another location. Ours is green, showing it as ours. And as you can see down here in Ethiopia, it's red, showing that it's the enemy capital. Okay, moving on from that, we are going to get into the more important stuff, which is armies. Now, we over here, uh, we over here have an army. There's a lot of people on the front line to Ethiopia, but they've got no order. They've got nothing to do. They've got no one leading them. We need to rectify this. We're going to grab these guys, left click and drag, nice box. Should have 14 units. If you don't, you might have clicked something else. Try again, grab it, and we are going to left click down here in this portrait. This will create a new army. Now, you'll probably see a lot of red asterisks, uh, red exclamation marks here. That means that there's a unit in an army that does not have an order. We're going to rectify this, but first we're going to get a general. There are two types of generals in this game. There's the field marshal and there's the general got the general which is designed to have a small number of troops but gets experience very 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 fast and has traits that are usually keyed into attacking or defending in different terrains or the like and then you've got the field marshal which is the geared to having a very large number of troops under their command while also having control of very large front lines and their orders tend to be, well, their traits tend to be things along the line of defensive stuff like more entrenchment or entrenchment speed uh, or offensive stuff like combat width. It doesn't have anything to do with little low uh, specific provinces like different terrain bonuses or anything like that. But it does look at the overall overarching section. For now, we're going to grab the general. This one here, this uh, level 4 general, is perfect for this. He's relatively well skilled. He has a trait that's not very important, but can be if you're using a lot of armor. And excellent, we now have him in charge. If we hover over this number, this skill 4 will show you what this guy gives. In this case, every skill level gives plus 5 attack and defense, plus 5 percent attack and defense I should say. Okay, so we've got these units now under his command. Awesome. Let's have a quick look at the unit, shall we? We've got the left bar. This is organization. This is how willing a unit is, uh, willing and able a unit is to fight. If the organization runs out, the unit will not be able to engage. If they're being attacked, they will retreat. If they are attacking, they will halt. Um, the next one over is their strength. You've got two things that tear into the strength. You've got the equipment you've got. For instance, you can see there it says 610 infantry equipment and 30 support equipment. That's great. That's your first uh, measure. So it'll go from z uh, up to uh, from 100 to 0 based on your equipment. And the other one is manpower, which is 100 to 0 there. It will take the lowest of those numbers. So if you're short on, say, you've got 53% of your equipment, but 74% of your manpower, then your fighting strength will be 
and you will fight a lot worse. You can have the men, but if they don't have guns, they're not very useful. Um, so, with next one over, we've got the exclamation mark, which says there's no orders. Um, next one over is a little picture of a helmet. This shows that this is an infantry regiment. If we go down a bit further, we have a mountain, a little picture of a mountain. They are mountaineers, so that's a mountaineer regiment. Very good. Um, yeah, you'll also notice that the mountaineer has three up-facing chevrons, which is good. They're in a nice, bright, orangey colour, which is... And it seems to look like it's a positive thing, which it is. These are elites. When they lose equipment and supplies, they will be the first ones to be replenished from stocks. So if you're short on guns and ammunition, and you want only specific people to get it, it's very useful to have the very important ones, like, say your main breakthrough tanks or your elite um, mountaineers to have the elite status so that they get their equipment first. On the other side, if there are units where you really don't care if they're particularly strong or not, they're just kind of there to hold position, so to speak, so you're not expecting to go through much at all, then you've got this one, which will essentially makes them reserves. These are colonial infantry, and these guys are set to have almost nothing. They are the same as the um, infantry, but as colonial, uh, these ones, if they're injured, will not get their gear first, they will get it last. Alright, next to that, we've got the training level. This varies between fresh to veteran, with um, different steps in the way. Fresh will give a penalty to units, it, um, it will take 25% off both their attack and defense, showing that these guys are literally guys you just handed a gun and threw off into the front lines and say, hey, go shoot that way. They don't know Jack, they've just got their gun, and they're not going to do very well. Up above that, you've got your trained troops, that's what these guys are, in the little shield with the two chevrons. Trained troops, uh, basically, that's the level you'll get them once they've completed their training from start to finish. So once you get those guys, they will have gone through their basic as well as their role training, and they'll understand what they are to do. They don't get a bonus, but they also don't get a penalty. They are what you expect from a troop. After that, you've got your regular troops. These are the guys who are trained slightly. They've been on, say, sir, they've been in the army for a while. They've had a bit of extra training. Perhaps they've been on some exercises. They know their weapons. They've been familiar with them. They've used them. So they tend to be a little bit better than those who are trained. They net a 25% bonus in combat. The next step up... <clears throat> is, um, I'm not sure exactly the name, I forget at the moment, but it will give 50% and the one after that is veterans, which gives 75%. If you get veteran units, they fight almost twice as strong as any other unit you have from basic. So keeping guys who are veteran status around and keeping their experience up can very much pay off. If you drop in some elite units into an area, they may well turn the tide of a battle that would otherwise be a stalemate. Okay, <clears throat> after that we've got the yellow bar here. Not all of them have it, as you can see, but all of them can have it. The, this denotes their experience gained to the next level. These trained divisions are halfway towards reaching the regular, which is good. It means they're halfway to getting an extra bonus, which is awesome. Um, you'll find that experience can rise in combat and the like, but it will drop in um, when you take casualties. If you're replacing men, your experience will drop, because the new people that are brought in are essentially greenhorns, and that's no fun. Okay, next to that we've got the entrenchment status. If they've got the shield and the um, Shovel, it shows that they're entrenched. I believe that this also does show something differently. Yes, if you attack, it has an arrow with a sword. If you uh, control right click, I believe it can support attack. It doesn't have a different shape. 
Mm. But um, <clears throat> this will show that they are digging in. There's also an arrow if you're moving or if you're strategically redeploying, it looks like a train track. This is the status of your unit. Alright, next to that you've got a bar which fills up, it's a blue bar. This is the bar of in, um, how entrenched your unit is. If your unit moves, it loses all entrenchment, but each day it will essentially dig into its position, making it harder to push away from. So if an enemy was to attack a deeply entrenched position, the defenders are going to defend a lot better than, the than they otherwise would have because they've had time to set up, say, some barbed wire or to properly check out um, different areas and flanking positions. Perhaps they knock down a wall to make sure that no one can flank them. It's stuff like that. They mold the area around them so that they can defend themselves better. The maximum number of entrenchment varies between um, different techs and different countries. Some countries have more maximum entrenchment than others, like France. Okay, next after that is the division name, and all the way over here we have the unassign button. This is for when you want to take them off the army that they're in. There are many reasons why you might want to do that. There are other ways to do it as well. Okay, this button here would re unassign all of the units, so essentially uh, unassign all the selected units. So if I was to select, say, these two and hit that, it would immediately unassign those two from the division. But I don't really want to do that. Okay, um, this will hold all divisions, so any divisions that are moving or attacking will immediately cease what they're doing. If they are retreating, they will not stop what they're doing because they're retreating. They don't give two shits about your orders, they're running away. After that, if we move across, we've got the total weight of the divisions. This is how many convoys, indicated up here, that you will need to be able to take these units across water. This is their weight, so to speak. I believe this is also their supply weight. May I have a quick look? No, it's not. Just completely ignore that. Okay, this is strategic redeployment on or off. This is where... Um, this is how you move units really quickly between front lines. If you click this button and then give a move order, the soldier will immediately start moving at a really, really fast rate from the location they're in to the location you told them to go to. However, their organization will be basically nothing. So if they're attacked while they're moving like this, then they're not going to fight for very long. They, it's like somebody's um, attacked, stopped the train, and all of the soldiers, half of them not even geared up, are now jumping out and trying to fight. They'll be routed pretty quickly. Now, if we keep moving across, we can see the number of units we have selected. I'm going to hit select all and select every single one. Um, after this, we've got change division template. This can change all of the units that you have selected to another one. If I click this, it'll come up with a list like this. But since we're not going to do that right now, we can ignore that. And then the one after this is disband all selected units. This will remove all of the manpower and all of the equipment from the units and put it back into your manpower pool and equipment pool. So say you've got a large number of casualties you need to fill. You've run out of manpower but you've got a bunch of uh, extra divisions which are all half filled. You can disband half of them and the men would go back to the manpower pool which will then be fed out to refill the casualties. The men that go back to the pool, however, do not can retain their experience, which is a shame, but it does allow you to move them to where they need to go. Alright, um, up here we've got the select all button, this will select all men onto that army. We've got the battle plan aggressiveness, we don't need to worry too much about that for now. This button is the exercise button, it will... Um, Generate the army experience for your country. I'll go into more detail later since we don't need to worry about it too much yet um, Over here. We've got the list of traits here. We've got the general skill 
Here we've got the picture of the general. Here we've got the army's name. This, uh, I'm going to quickly rename this to the Northern Ethiopia. Yep, Northern Ethiopia. So, there we go. This army is now called Northern Ethiopia. Alright, and that's everything you need to really know from that um, page there. Now, we want to get rid of these red exclamation marks, so we're going to give these guys orders. There's a few ways we can do this, but the main way is you go down here. You can see the general's portrait here. If you were to click on him, it would select him. It would um, select all of the units there. And then we um, select from the battle plans menu here, this little box. We will set up plans and the like to begin telling where we want to defend, where we want to attack, where we want to advance. For now, we're going to set up a front line. This is where he will assign units to protect. So we're going to grab this and we are going to left click in the middle province here. And it adds a front line to the entire thing. All three of these provinces now have a front line. So all 14 are selected and attached to this. If you look down here, it should have 14 written there. If it doesn't, hit select all. Go down and hit this button here. It's got the little plus in the corner with a dotted line with a man standing in front and an arrow. Click that, and then the flashing line there, the front line, click it. And it will assign all of the men to that front line. That way, if your front line doesn't have enough men, you can reassign everybody there really quickly. Or if you want to move them between front lines, you can do it as well. Now, we've now got an order. He has the order to defend this line here. He doesn't have an attack order, he has a defend order. They will defend that line unless they've got an attack order. So we will give him one. Next to the front line button, we are, there is the offense line button. This is drawn in enemy territory. And this is where you design your um, aim. This is where you want to, your men to go. So we are going to go all the way down to here. We are going to select this province, and we are going to go across those two provinces there. And that's awesome. We now have a front line. So, as we can see here, we've got, if we scroll in, we can see 14 divisions, Northern Ethiopia. I've spelt Ethiopia wrong. There we go, Northern Ethiopia. Okay, so now he has an attack order. That's awesome, but he's not going to do it even if we unpaused. If we unpaused right now, what he would do is he'd sit there and go, Okay, I will think about this for a while, but I won't do it until you tell me to, sir. And that's fine, we'll tell him to right now, shall we? If we go down to his portrait, we can see a quick look at, um, a quick overview. You can see the color, which is a light bluish here. That indicates the color of the units there. So a quick look at the map will give you, say, oh, that's a, that's an aqua, so that assigns to that general. Excellent. So I know that your men are there. Perfect. Um, underneath that, we've got, well, the general's portrait. We've got 1424, 14 of the units uh, are under his control of 24 that he can handle quite happily. And under that, there's a little green bar that has um, a slight bit of red in the end. This is a force calculation. This is where your general says, I think we could take these guys. I think it's really, uh, I think it's ready and rare to go, I can handle this. Or if it's full, near full red, they're like, they are overwhelmingly strong, please help. At the moment, it's mostly green, which is good. So, we are going to hit this tick button here, and we'll activate the attack order. So, awesome. They are now going to begin the attack. They are going to advance in, and the aim is going to be to take as many victory points as we can to force them to capitulate. Capitulate is the word for their surrender. Now, they will surrender when, if we click this button here, and we go over to Ethiopia, if we hover over this green bar, 
it will say they are 0% towards capitulation. It controls 100% of victory points and will capitulate when it has 30% or less. That's good. Um, yeah. Once we get over 70% of their victory points at the stroke of midnight, they will give up. And that'll be that. That will be the end of Ethiopia. They will quit and then we go to the peace table. Which we will do pretty quickly. It won't take long. Okay, so he's got his order, he's got his things. Now, the victory points, what are they? Well, each province is worth 0.1 victory points. Anything with a red dot is worth a larger amount of victory points. For instance, this is worth 1. If we go over here, there's another one that's worth 1. And if we have a look at the capital, the capital is actually worth 5. Now, if we have a look at this guy's capital, it's worth 3. You can hover over the capitals, the red dots, all the white grey dots, and you can see how many victory points they are worth. So, we need to take, well, probably the victory point here, here, and here, and they will give up. I'm very confident on that. But, we're attacking from two directions, and we should make use of that. Let's make ourselves a second army, shall we? Let's grab these guys, four divisions, and we're going to make a new army. So highlight, left click here. We now have a new army. Now there's another way to make your front lines. We're going to first assign a new general. We'll select this guy, he looks good for it. And I showed before where you click this button and then you click and you get a front line. That's all well and good. But um, if if you want to be more specific with, uh, with your front lines, instead of having some really long front line along the border of somebody, or where it could get really messy, you can actually right click and drag along the provinces you want to set as the front lines. So if we do that, like that, even though it's exactly the same, we get ourselves a bit of practice. So we've got all four selected, we've set the front line, all four are attached, good. We'll now give him an attack order. And the attack order looks good. If we have a look, he says that the force, it's, we're stronger, but not by much. So we will want to try and get an edge up on them. What we're going to do is, we're not actually going to let him attack yet. What we're going to let him do is get his planning bonus up. So every day at midnight, when he's got a front line and he's got an attack order that the men are attached to that are on the front line of, they will gain a little bit of planning bonus. A planning bonus is 2% per um, evening spent planning, and once the plans get up to its max, which is by default 50%, um, when you set the attack order off, it will do up to 50% extra damage, which is very helpful in these situations where the enemy is, although weaker, not substantially weaker. We could do with attacking them in ways that would not kill us as many. They've got five units, we may have four, and our men may be better, but we can fight better. So we will let them set up and he'll have his plan and he'll do that. Okay, so that's the basics of the army stuff. I should quickly go into um, the starting and stopping orders as well. As I said before, this will start an order. If you want to stop an order, the little square here will stop the order. We'll start it back up. That was just an example. I'm also going to quickly show you if you make a plan that you don't like. For instance, we've got this. Huh, I don't really like that. That's in the wrong place. Or, I don't think that order's relevant anymore. Over here, we've got the delete order. If you right click, you will delete all of the orders. If you left click, you can then left click on an order and you will delete that order. You can delete orders from different armies um, through that. We'll go over what all the other buttons do later, but for now, we're pretty much ready to go. Except for one thing. We want to give ourselves a slight advantage. That way we lose even less Italians. So, what we're going to do is give ourselves some aerial support. As I said before, there are a few different types of planes. If we click here on this layer field, it opens up this menu, we can actually see the air regions. Um, you can see here, East Africa covers all of the Somali area, plus some extra space to the south. 
which is exactly what we need. We want to cover this area and we don't want to have any trouble from them. So we are going to, as I said, click there. If you haven't for some reason selected them all or you've clicked one and you want to select them all nice and quickly, you can hit A on the keyboard or you can click that button and you will select all of them or deselect. It, uh, it will alternate between the two. Now we want these guys to operate in East Africa, so we'll right click here. This will assign them to that area. You can see all of the active aircraft in the region on this side here. If we close that out, since we don't need to see that anymore, it's just taking up space, we see that East Africa is still a grey. Well, that's no good. Well, let's quickly, uh... Let's take a moment and see that uh, there's no aircraft assigned to fighters or to bombers or any of that. Which is no good. We definitely need them to be doing things. Well, we know we've got fighters here, so why aren't they there? They haven't got a mission. That's why. If we click this button here, they will get the air superiority mission. This is where the fighters will fly around and engage other fighters. And if there are no fighters, it will engage bombers and the like after that. So, the first tier is, um, during its uh, mission cycle, it will go, is there fighters to attack? If yes, attack fighters. If not, attack other um, aircraft. So, that mission will allow you to fight other fighters. Which is good. We aren't going to be fighting any, this is Ethiopia, but if we do that, we'll gain air superiority for sure. Now, next one, we've got TAC Bombers. As I had said before, we the TAC Bombers are about destroying buildings or infrastructure and the like, as are Strategic Bombers. These guys are just good at it. They can also be used to attack, um, air, uh, attack people, but we're not going to bother with that. We're going to set these guys up on the Strategic Bombing. That way, they are bombing the hell out of everything as we advance. And finally, we need to give our troops a bit of extra um, cover. So we're going to have uh, some aircraft do some close air support. What these guys are going to do is, if there's a fight going on, they are going to jump in and damage some of the enemy and then disappear. And they'll do that up to two times a day. So if a battle drags on for three days, it, the aircraft drops in and does essentially six attacks against them before returning to base and restocking and all of that. So we're going to set them to close air support and that's perfect. It's still grey and it will go green as soon as we unpause because these guys have missions and the enemy does not have more planes. Alright, now close that out and as I would said before click this button here if you want to change back to the default map which is what we're going to work with. Okay, I think that's about it for that, um, most of this first episode. So we are going to let the AI handle this war. The AI is not the only way to handle these fights, but once everything is done and everything's in place, we've got the orders going, we've got this guy um, manning the front and preparing. Once all of this initial setup is done, we're going to hit this button and we're going to continue. It shouldn't take too long. Speed 1, and now it goes, and as you can see, the men have begun attacking. We can see here that the bobble is green. It's got 64, so we're 64% of the way through the fight. It's not 64% chance of success. It's 64% of the way through the fight. So, if we have a look over here, we've got pretty much the same, 68, and then over here, 60. You can also see that there's a little red skull across there. That shows that there is attrition. So our units are taking attrition as they're fighting. Every hour they are in battle, there's a chance that they will lose equipment. Say a gun will break, an artillery battery will die, it will explode out, leaving shrapnel everywhere, or, you know, a truck will break down in a way that's not repairable. So, you're going to need a constant influx of materials to repair. That's why you've got the production lines. They will be producing guns and other equipment that your men will be using in your fights and your exercises. 
Okay, so that seems to be going well. And if we go down here, as we can see, he's begun moving that guy over here to fill out that position. I honestly don't think he's doing a very good job. So I'm going to move him there and move him there. That way we've got the front line filled by the closest people. And we'll let the planning commence. Okay, it's been an evening. Let's have a look at this guy. He was stationary last night. So around midnight, he gained himself some planning bonus. As you can see, if you hover over here, this bar is now 2% of 50%. So it's gone up 4%, which is awesome. It's what we want to see. As it progressively um, grows, you'll get the higher bonus, which is good. Okay, finally, let's have a quick look at combat. This will be the last bit, and then I'll let it go all the way to the end of the wall. If we click on that, it'll come up with the attack screen. This will give us all the information on the battle that is ongoing. We can see here the attacker is on the left, the defender on the right. We've got the traits of the leader here, and both sides, you can see the traits there. We've got the general's portrait. We've got a nice little glow and two arrows here. I'll go over that in a moment. Uh, we've got the general skill here. We've got um, how much width we are using here. We've got how much width we can fill here. And this is how much width they are filling. There's other modifiers that would fill in here. And if we were attacking in such a way that not every unit was able to make it to the front line, down here would be where our reserves are. These are units that aren't in the battle, but are ready to join, and every hour it will it has a percentage chance of rejoining. Or joining into the fight. Okay, now what's this sec uh, center section? I kind of just kind of ignored it, didn't I? Well, this is the tactic that the generals have chosen. The uh, tactic is one choice against another choice. So, without seeing what the other one rolls, it will pick a tactic and it will put it out there. And then they choose a tactic and they put theirs out there. So you've got, it's like rock, paper, scissors. Some of the attacks, uh, tactics will counter others. There's like a rock being brought out in front of a scissor. It will just crush it, making the scissors completely worthless. At the moment, this is more like uh, two people have just put out rocks. We've got attack and defend. So... In theory, both sides get a little bit of extra attack. Plus 5% tactic damage and plus 5% tactic damage. You can see it if you hover over the numbers down here. Now, if you click here, this will bring up a tactics list. There's different versions of tactics. Um, there's bridge combat. There's tactics that are very specific to certain trees. Um, but yeah, that's uh, here is the list of what it is, and if you hover over, you can see, I believe, there should be a counters section. Hmm, well, somewhere through here, like a counter attack would counter attack I believe so if you attack you sure you're able to counter some of them it, it's somewhere in that list you're able to figure out what counters what and you'll be able to go oh cool so they've used that which is good I can the, my general can roll this to counter it if that comes up again but you don't have any real control over this in any way but in order to make it so that you have some ability to predict whether you're going to be better than them or not, there's a thing called initiative. If the initiative of a um, general is higher than the other's general, then they will get a second attempt at countering a, a enemy's tactic. So they essentially roll to choose one. So they can choose between different tactics. I believe... Hmm, I don't know too much about what goes into it, but having this essentially gives you an extra chance at making sure that if your tactic is counted, you can uncounter it, which is nice. Okay, um, 
Now let's have a quick look at the units. We can see the name of the unit here. We can see their type based on the little image that they had if they were Mountaineers. Let's have a quick look at the Mountaineer one, which is over here. Um, the Mountaineers are there. You can see any penalties or bonuses across here. You can see a river crossing takes my attack and defense down by 30%, but for others it's say higher. Like terrain, minus 25% there, minus 60% there. What does that correspond to? Well, there's a few different stats. You've got your soft attack, which is your attack against unarmed, unarmored opponents. You've got your hard attack, which is your attacks against hard opponents, like armor or mechanized units or things that have a slight bit of hardness. And then you've got your, in on the defender side, you've got your defense, which is how many chances you get to dodge enemy attacks. And on the attacker side, you've got your breakthrough, which is your ability to dodge enemy attacks on the offense. So usually you'll have a much higher number on your defense than you would on your breakthrough. Breakthrough is useful on divisions that um, you want to punch, the, do a lot of attacking with, and you don't want them to be worn out. So if you've got, say, a tank with a lot of breakthrough, you put them in, doesn't take much damage, it's able to avoid a lot of the damage, and beats down the unit, and is able to keep moving, and can be moved into the next fight really quickly. Okay, so that's the basics of that. You'll also see that there's the entrenchment here, as I said, bonuses and negatives there. And yeah, you've got other bonuses and negatives here, like shore bombardment, enemy superiority, decryption. It'll all be listed here. Okay, that's enough about that. We'll go into more division um, development and design later. For now, it's fine, we can ignore it. We'll just let it roll. Now, this will take ages at speed 1, so we're just going to speed it up to speed 3 and sit back and watch the AI do its thing. It was a micromanagement hell in Hearts of Iron 3 for a lot of movement and the like. You would have to micromanage everything. I want these units moving there, I want these moving there, I want that time, at this time, I want them to attack during the day, I want them to start the attack just before dawn, that type of stuff. It was a bit of a pain, but as time, as Hearts of Iron 4 goes, the AI can be relied on to execute your plans a lot better. So, as you can see, it's now been a few days, our attacks are good, and this front is now a lot more empty, which is good. He's also had some time to plan, so yeah, I think it's about time for him to get involved. We'll rename him to Southern. Ethiopia. Southern. Southern Ethiopia. There we go. Alright, we'll uh, have him begin. So he should now begin his assault. Alright, so this will all be done nice and quickly. Okay, we can have a look. As you can see, he's already advanced forward. He's taken some land. So, the general has begun attacking and holding others into position while he maneuvers around. Why are you even bothering going there? There we go. If units do silly things, you can stop them from doing what they're doing and, say, move into other things. Now, attacking into mountains is pretty much never a good idea, so these battles will take a bit longer. You can see them flipping between yellow and red as different things happen. Also, the AI, by default, has a habit of changing out their generals a lot, so you'll be fighting a lot of, frankly, weaker generals than they should be. Okay, so, other than that, I'll move it up to speed 4 and I'll just let it go. You might see that over here we've got missing equipment production. We aren't making fighters to replace those we lost. We're losing planes because, even though we're not fighting, there's a chance every time they take off that they will have an accident. 
If a plane has an accident, it's totaled. So you can't be bringing that plane back into fight. We click on the strategy game map. You can also see that it's green. Now, with um, aerial superiority, it gives you a lot of really, really nice bonuses. It gives you the ability to fight better. As you could see from here, it makes their defense lower. Um, it also does some damage to them if you've got the right type of planes attacking. And you've also got other things as well, like slowing down enemy that is trying to move in an area you've got superiority. If you've got aerial superiority, you will crush, uh, you will slow down an enemy far faster. As you can see, these guys who were um, green are now trained, so they've gotten enough experience to move up and no longer fight as bad. Which is awesome to see. If we have a look here, we've actually lost a lot of equipment attacking into the mountains. Our standard divisions here, they're kind of injured. You can see that they've lost no manpower, but we are very, very short on infantry equipment. On the attack, you will lose a lot of infantry equipment. It is frankly insane. But it's good, it keeps your war industry um, ticking over and it always makes sure you have things that you need to build building, which is good. As you can see, I've done almost nothing and the AI has advanced beautifully. Okay, not much longer and that will be that. It's been about three months, which is a lot quicker than Ethiopia um, surrendered initially, but it's not quite over yet. They might still do something silly, like all be sitting on the capital and not beat and uh, manage to beat me back. But I doubt it. We're just letting the AI do its thing. All right, good. So they're pushing him off there. Okay. So, our first thing is done. We get the world news popping up telling us that um, the Rhineland has been remilitarized. But we've managed to complete our focus as well. Most of those pop-ups and events will be tied to national focuses of different countries. That one increased world tension a little, but in Germany they've now got the ability to move into this area, which if you remember I didn't point it out, but this entire area here had a little red outline. That was showing that it was demilitarized. They weren't able to put in any of their military, which is no good. Well, no good for them, anyway. And since they're going to be our ally, it was definitely no good for us. Anyway, we finished our national focus. 70 days, all good. You could save up to 10 days worth of progress to be dumped in immediately. But from here... We should definitely be looking at... Well, we can't take that one. That one will be useful. Once we've beaten Ethiopia, we can. But we will go down to industrial effort. We'll take the next step and we'll get ourselves to four more civilian factories, which is exactly what we need. All right, back to the Ethiopian front. Okay, this fight has almost finished, their strength is waning, and they retreated and they were immediately beaten back again. Yeah, so they look like they're almost at the point of taking the capital. Good. So this is almost finished. I think my generals did pretty well. Now if we click him, we can see he's actually gotten enough experience already to get to skill 5, and he has a new trait, Mountaineer. He gets extra movement, uh, attack, and defense in mountains, which is awesome. He's also learning a few other things. If you hover over his portrait, it'll have a list of all of the traits that they are on the way of learning. If we have a look at the other guy, he's skilled too. He only had four people under his command, but he's still managing to skill up nicely. All these guys over here are also almost ready to be um, considered real troops. We've almost fully trained the green horns over here as well, so everything is going really well. Except for the loss of equipment that's grinding this to a halt. 
Remember, if you don't have your equipment, you don't fight anywhere near as strong. And that's not good. You want to be fighting as much as possible. Yep, skill 5 versus his skill 3. Fighting into mountains. But we look like we are almost done. Ah. Okay. Tech for electro mecha electrical mechanical engineering. Electronic mechanical engineering is done. We can go radios, but we are going to continue improving our research speed so we can research things even faster. This will take 243 days, but it will save 3% of time elsewhere, which can be many, many, many days on things such as nuclear um, testing and other such fun things. As you can see, occasionally we'll land in a province and the AI will have been moving into it, meaning they attack. Attacks are done from a province into the next, not like EU4 where you put the two provinces, uh, the two people together in the same province and then they duke it out. So you can end up surrounding a province and crushing a unit from the outside giving them nowhere to run in um, this, unlike in EU4 where you can have troops on all sides but they'll still just run through. Okay, the wars dragged on a bit longer than expected actually. I'm going to change what you're doing, actually. Yep, good, you're attacking that way now. Get more flank, get more men in. They're basically not even doing any damage out, so our attack is fine. And we should shift them momentarily. In the meantime, if you have a look up here, our army experience is flying up. Every... A uh, unit that is in battle will generate you experience per hour they're in battle. So the more fights that you have in this, the better. Which, uh, it's a good way to pad your early army experience, which is used to modify your templates, as well as modify tanks and other armored variants. Okay, we've taken the province, and that's them all finished. Good. So, Ethiopia. We are going to take all of Ethiopia. We go down to the Make Demands and we hit Take All States. We can do that or we could puppet them. So if I unclick that, we can puppet them. That'll make a fascist ruler in Ethiopia, but Ethiopia will be able to field its own army and can kind of look after itself. And if I trade with them, they have to give me the things that I ask for without me having to give them a factory, which is awesome. But yeah, we are going to take all states either way. Yep, Italian demands, take Ethiopia, hit done, and then done, pause, and that's that. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for joining me. This is the second episode. It's another long one. Sorry about that. But that is the basics of warfare, units, um, front lines, drawn front lines and the like. There is more advanced front lines, which I'll be going into soon. But for now, thank you very much for joining me. I am Hydronum and this has been the second episode of Hearts of Iron 4 tutorial as Italy. Next up, we are going to prepare for the inevitable World War II. We can go ham and start attacking things if we really like, but we are going to prepare for, say, an invasion of France, and perhaps we can even go and support Spain in the inevitable civil war, which should be popping up very, very, very soon. Alright, cheers for coming. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.